Hello, I'm Simon Whistler. You're watching Top 10's Net, and in the video today, the Top 10 Notorious Highwaymen and Women. During their heyday, roughly from the 16th to the 19th centuries, highwaymen were considered a special type of criminal, known for their good manners, noble bearing, and in some cases at least, their scrupulous moral values. Some of the best known operated in Britain, France, and other European countries, as well as in their overseas territories. And famously, highwaymen were said to give each of their wealthy victims the almost gentlemanly ultimatum of stand and deliver your money or your life. Many have since attained a kind Kind of folk hero status, but it wasn't uncommon for highwaymen to be revered in their own day as well. This is hardly surprising, of course, considering these gallant rogues on horseback were acting out the largely suppressed fantasies of the downtrodden underclass. In many cases, they even stole from the rich and did indeed give to the poor. They also tended to die fairly young, most before they were even 30. There were dozens of iconic highwaymen and even some highway women. In the video today, we're looking at just 10 noteworthy examples including some of the most notorious, unusual, or cherished from all around the world. Just before we get started, I do want to say that there's going to be some foreign pronunciations. I'm trying my best, but not guaranteed to get them all right. Number 10. Louis Dominique Garthausen (1693–1721). Louis Dominique Garthausen, aka Bourguignon, aka Cartouche, was the embodiment of a dashing rogue. Born to a German mercenary turned French wine seller, he was equal parts rapacious hooligan and refined gentleman. By his teenage years, he was already in charge of a small band of thieves, and by his twenties, he was leading a gang. This gang would pillage wealthy travelers along the Versailles to Paris route. Once disguised as a wealthy marquis, he actually robbed a police lieutenant of the bounty that was on his own head. Besides wealth and prestige, only two things mattered to Garthausen, one being his reputation as a crowd pleaser. He was, for example, well known for his strong sense of moral justice, even or especially when breaking the law. Robbing private mansions and distributing the spoils to the poor was all in a day's work for Cartouche, but more impressive were his poetically good deeds, like saving a bankrupt merchant from suicide by paying off his credit and then promptly robbing back the money. He also pleased crowds at carnival time by pushing a cart full of police effigies and openly whipping them for the parade, a satirical protest of the police's own custom of publicly punishing criminals. He would no doubt be pleased with how he's gone down in history. He's remembered as a folk hero in France, a villain with a heart of gold. He even got his own movie, the swashbuckling comedy caper Cartouche, from 1962. The other thing that mattered to Garthausen above all else was loyalty, or honor among thieves. Following his capture, or recapture, having unsuccessfully tunneled out of the first dungeon he was in, he was prepared to undergo the most atrocious tortures to protect the names of his associates. Only when it came to the very moment of his own execution, having seen from the scaffold that no one was coming to save him, did Garthausen meticulously list each and every one of his friends and the crimes that they had committed. He was then beaten to death on the breaking wheel, and his corpse was displayed for the public. Number 9. Nicolas Jacques Pelletier (1756–1792). Nicolas Jacques Pelletier was the first person executed by guillotine, a device specifically designed to be as humane as possible. Actually, the guillotine was still in development when Pelletier was condemned to die, and it took the intervention of the judge, who apparently pitied the highwayman, to hurry its construction up in the name of humanity, and to spare the unfortunate man for whom each moment that prolongs his life must be a death, the agony of an extended waiting period. Or perhaps he was just eager to see Pelletier killed. For many years, the bandit had been terrorizing the Parisian elite, seemingly hell-bent on becoming the richest man alive. For many years, he also managed to evade capture, living longer than many highwaymen, living to the ripe old age of 36. However, the law finally caught up with him on the night of October the 14th, 1791, when cries in the street alerted the authorities to his whereabouts. Having violently attacked, robbed, and possibly killed a man on the Rue de Bourbon Villeneuve, Pelletier was chased down, arrested, and quickly charged for his crime, and he was sentenced to death in December. But it wasn't until the following March that the guillotine was finally ready for use. Number 8. Philip Twisden from 1714 to 1752 
Like many highwaymen, Philip Twisden led a double life, but his was especially incongruent. Not only was he an Oxford-educated doctor of civil law, but he was also the Bishop of Raffo in Ireland, having been nominated to the rule by none other than King George II himself. It is thought that he turned to a life of crime after running out of money in London, effectively bankrupting his family. But he wasn't very good at it. In fact, he was shot and killed by the very first person he attempted to rob. Ironically, a medical doctor. The night before, Twisden is said to have removed the charge from the doctor's guns, only for an interfering patient to point it out to the man. When the masked bishop held up the doctor the following night, boldly assuming him to be defenseless, he was shot down himself, and his identity was revealed. Nevertheless, presumably to hold up the king's reputation, not to mention the church's virtue, the official cause of death was listed as inflammation, and Twisden's crime was covered up. Number 7. Jack Shepherd from 1702 to 1724 Born into poverty in Spitalfields, London, Jack Shepard actually started out on the straight and narrow, becoming an accomplished carpenter by the age of 20. But he soon fell in with criminals and prostitutes, frequenting the taverns of Drury Lane and developing a taste for the lifestyle. It wasn't long before he fell in with highwayman Jonathan Blueskin Wilde and the rest of his gang. Shepard's career as a criminal took off, and between 1723 and 1724, he was jailed on five occasions for robbery and escaped on all but one. And and that's thanks in part to his knowledge of carpentry. The first time he removed the bars from the window and escaped with his lover, Edgeworth Bess, on strung together sheets and blankets. The second time, Bess and another prostitute, Moll Maggot, helped him escape by squeezing his slight five foot four inch frame out of between the iron spikes and into a lady's dress. Another time, he simply slipped out of his handcuffs and lockpicked or forced his way to freedom. His exploits were so daring and dramatic that he was rapidly embraced as a hero, particularly by London's working classes. Even Daniel Defoe, the author of Robinson Crusoe, became a fan of the young rascal and ghostwrote the highwayman's biography. In fact, when Shepard was finally brought to the gallows in 1724, aged just 22, Defoe and his publisher Appleby had a plan to help him escape. Believing it to be possible to survive 15 minutes hanging by the neck, they intended to retrieve his body as soon as the crowds had gone. But unfortunately, Shepard's massive popularity was also his final undoing. His execution was unexpectedly well attended by some 200,000 people including weeping women in white who threw flowers on the ground for the scoundrel. When the trapdoor swung open beneath his feet, his adoring crowd jostled forward to pull on them, ensuring a quick and painless death. Number 6. James Ford from 1775 to 1833 by day, Kentuckian James Ford maintained a squeaky clean public image as a pillar of the community, known for his civic leadership roles and various business accomplishments. By night, however, he led a shadowy gang of river pirates and highwaymen plotting from a remote wilderness hideout known today as Illinois' iconic Cave in Rock. Far from being a gentleman rogue, Ford actually had dealings with John Hart Crenshaw, an illegal slaver who kidnapped free blacks from the north and sold them back into slavery in the south. He also reportedly leased land to the notorious Sturdivant gang of counterfeiters. But Ford himself is far better known for hijacking flatboats on the Ohio River, even going so far as to steal the farm goods entrusted to his own ferry service. Perhaps fittingly for a criminal who outwardly represented the man, it wasn't the authorities who eventually brought Ford to justice, but a band of unknown vigilantes who assassinated him in 1833. By the way, if you're a fan of the TV series Lost, this name might sound rather familiar to you. It was the name of the conman character Sawyer in what is no doubt a very intentional nod. Of course, since we just had a Jack Shepard, maybe the creators of Lost were huge fans of Highwaymen. Number 5. Sam Poo from 1838 to 1865 In 19th century Australia, highwaymen were known as bush rangers, spending much of their time in the bush and preying on passers-by. Many, like Alexander Pierce, were convicts who escaped from British penal colonies, while others, like Ned Kelly, were descended from them. Yet others came to Australia in search of gold, only to get disillusioned with the hard graft and slim pickings of prospecting and turn to a life of crime. One such man, well, that was Sam Poo, the only Chinese Bush Ranger in all of Australian history. A dark and enigmatic character, Pooh lived in isolation at his camp in the bush, practicing his shooting on an old tree stump. And unlike many other highwaymen and bush rangers, of whom flattering photos or etchings abound, only one oversaturated and sinister looking 
photo of Sam Poo allegedly has ever been found. Nevertheless, he must have been fairly conspicuous in his day, and it didn't take long to locate him. Following a spate of highway robberies in 1865, 29-year-old trooper John Ward was alerted to Poo's whereabouts. When Ward arrived at the camp, Poo fled into the bush and shot him in the groin, yelling, You policeman, me fire! Ward died of his wound shortly afterwards, and a manhunt was launched in response. Cornered for a second time, Pooh again shot the authorities out of nowhere, narrowly missing the aboriginal tracker who'd helped find him. This time, however, Pooh was also shot, arrested, and forced to stand trial. Before the year was out, he was hanged at Bathurst Jail. Number 4. Mary Bryant, knee broad, 1765-2, unknown. The only one on this list whose fate remains unknown is also one of only two women. Although originally sentenced to death for highway robbery of little more than a silk bonnet from a spinster in 1786, Mary Broad was deported to Australia instead, one of the first fleet of convicts to be shipped to the new colony when she was just 21 years old. There she married fellow convict William Bryans and became one of the first escapees. With seven others, she, along with her husband and children, stowed away on a Dutch trading ship. Now, although they didn't get very far from Australia, their voyage took them thousands of miles around the coast of the Great Barrier Reef to the island of Timor, a 69-day trip in total. Posing as shipwreck survivors and attempting to settle in the Dutch colony, it wasn't long before they were outed as convicts and summarily jailed at Batavia. This is present-day Jakarta in Indonesia. It was here that Mary's husband and son tragically succumbed to disease. Mary and her daughter Charlotte, ironically the name of the ship that took Mary to Australia in the first place, were sent back to England, but only the mother survived the voyage. Upon her arrival back home in June of 1792, Mary was immediately imprisoned. But less than a year later, still in her 20s, she was fully pardoned and freed. Thanks in no part to the intervention of a respected Scottish lord and writer, James Boswell, who was apparently captivated by her tale. Little is known about her life after that, but it is expected that she returned to her family in Cornwall and to her life before stealing that fateful silk bonnet. Number 3. Lady Catherine Ferrers from 1634 to 1660. Catherine Ferrers was no stranger to her wealth and luxury. Born into nobility, she became the sole heir of her grandfather's fortune at the age of just six, following the death of her father. And when her mother died some years later, she was left alone with her servants in her spacious childhood home. This is the imposing Marquiate cell near Luton in England. Although she was married off young to her stepbrother, Thomas Fanshaw, her husband spent much of his time away, fighting on behalf of the king in the English Civil War. She was also apparently involved with another man anyway, the working-class highwayman Ralph Chaplin, with whom she is said to have joined forces. Although historians disagree on whether he really existed, it's easy to imagine a bored, lonely heiress getting her kicks with a known criminal. But even if he did exist, her enduring reputation as the Wicked Lady cannot be attributed to his influence alone. Following Chaplin's supposed hanging for highway robbery, Ferrers went on undeterred, haunting the absolutely named No Man's Land Common in the countryside close to her home. Something of an evil Bruce Wayne, she is said to have had a secret room tucked away behind a staircase in her manor, and it was here that she prepared for her nighttime raids. Donning the traditional highwayman's garb, a tricorn hat, a black mask, and cloak, she took off each night through a secret exit on the back of a jet black horse. But unlike other highwaymen, she wasn't in it for the loot. Instead, she appears to have enjoyed the thrill of terrorizing travelers from the darkness, attacking and often brutally murdering her victims. She is also thought to have slain cattle, shot a policeman, and burned down houses while the occupants were asleep inside. Her excitement came to an abrupt end, though, when she was just 26. She was wounded and killed during a holdup. Servants dutifully recovered her body from the scene, and she was buried at a church in Ware. But her memory and a hint at the location of her spoils lives on in a local rhyme. Near the cell there is a well, near the well there is a tree, under the tree the treasure be. Number 2. Robert Snooks, 1761-1802 in 1802, Robert Snooks became the last man in England to be hanged for highway robbery. His real name was actually James Snooks, but his notoriety as a thief meant many people knew him as that robber Snooks. This corrupted over time to Robert and stuck even for the inscription on his gravestone. He spent the latter part of his life as a fugitive and was actually tried in 1799 for the theft of a horse, a crime for which there was ultimately too little evidence to convict him. But Snooks's career-defining criminal caper was the holdup and robbery of 
of a postal career in the spring of 1801. Ambushing the Tring Mail on Boxmoor Hemel Hempstead, he stole several bags of letters from a bewildered postboy, and many of these were stuffed with high-value banknotes. Unfortunately for him, these were too incriminating to be spent. He was identified trying to exchange one for some fine cloth in London, and a bounty was placed on his head. Now, this wasn't the standard £100 parliamentary reward for highwaymen, although that would have been hefty enough, the Postmaster General also offered to put up £200 of his own money. Naturally, it wasn't long before Snooks was apprehended by his former schoolmates, no less, and he was sentenced to hang at the scene of the crime, as was the custom. But he is said to have retained his dignity and wit to the last, enjoying a final drink at the Swan Inn and helpfully telling passers-by on their way to his execution, It's no use hurrying, they can't start the fun until I get there. Number 1. Juraj Janoszek, 1688-1713 Juraj Janoszek is relatively little known outside of Slovakia, but in his homeland he is venerated as a folk hero similar to Robin Hood in England, and for much the same reasons as well. He even has his own gleaming 25-foot statue overlooking the Vratna Valley ski resort and keeping watch over the village of his birth. As if that wasn't enough, he also has been depicted on national currency as well as in numerous films. Janoszek was introduced to his ultimate calling through legitimate work as a soldier. Posted as a prison guard at Beach he gradually became friends with one of the more notorious convicts. This was a man named Tomasz Uhorsik, the leader of a band of thieves. It's unclear whether Janoszek helped his new friend escape, but they met again on the outside, this time joining forces for a heist. And when Uhorsik decided to settle down with his wife, Janoszek was appointed as his successor. Although his career as a criminal was brief, Janoszek rapidly made a name for himself. He knew how hard life as a peasant could be, and he was always willing to share his spoils with the poor. And in return, the poor were usually happy to help him hide from the authorities. But after just two years at the top, Janoszek, now aged 25, was captured. This happened while he was visiting his old friend Ohorsik. During the trial that followed, Janoszek's legendary reputation ultimately contributed to his downfall. Dozens of testimonies were given over an arduous two-month period. Yet, despite the merciless torture he was subjected to, he never gave up the names of his accomplices. He even refused to betray them in exchange for a last-minute reprieve on the day of his execution, famously saying to his guards, If you have baked me, so you should eat me. He then impaled himself on a hook and remained there for three whole days. Apparently, the public uproar was such that guards were unable to remove his body any earlier. So I really hope you enjoyed that video, and don't forget to subscribe to this channel for brand new videos every day of the week. Also, I've got another channel, it's called Biographics, it's biographies of notable people from the present day, as well as history from Elon Musk to Osama Bin Laden. You can check it out through the icon on the screen now. But if you want something else to watch right now, why not check out another Top 10s video or a Biographics video over there on the right. And as always, thank you for watching.